well, thanks for the invite. I'm uh, very pleased to be here to kind of walk a, a, a bit down memory lane for me, but then also bring us right up to date at, at the end on technology. <clears throat> you know, I've been working in um, microprocessor design and system design since the uh, late 1980s. And, and so what I wanted to do is, is give a perspective on some of the trends. And, and obviously, if you've been in this business for a while, you'll see, you know, the circular nature of the industry as different integration levels change the dynamics of how people build systems. Uh, so even some of the older uh, insights can, I think, still uh, be interesting today. So let's move on. And, and just to be clear, I'm presenting my personal views on this. This isn't official uh, views of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So I'm going to start by giving some motivation around uh, use cases for scalable memory systems and then sort of walk through um, a few decades of technology uh, of how things have evolved up to our late, some of the latest systems we're delivering at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And then um, talk a little bit more about the memory storage hierarchy, which I'm sure is uh, very familiar to a lot of people here. Um, but then also uh, talk a little bit to the future of uh, memory semantic fabrics and and some of the work going on in the industry right now. So uh, just to kind of kick off, I think most of you have seen a similar slide in one way or another to this, where <clears throat> we all know we're getting an exponential growth of data that we're processing um, you know, from various sources. Obviously, now we've got just tons of sources of data, instruments, sensors. It's, the data is just exploding. But this growth is happening just when traditional computing techniques have kind of um, slowed down with the, you know, basically the end of Denard scaling, the power down density of transistors and with Moore's law slowing down. So we still get a few more transistors, but not as many as we used to each year. Um, and so this is kind of the challenge. How do we build systems to um, help us gain insights between you know what what's uh, what patterns what information what insights we can gain from the data with uh, processing technology and <clears throat> this is um when uh, we come right up to today with hpe with our superdome flex that's our large shared memory system we're shipping today i'll talk more about that in the future future but it's you know we can have up to 48 terabytes of DRAM today in one system. So, you know, hundreds to, to thousands of uh, threads of execution. But within that memory footprint, <clears throat> what you can do if, if you get your data sets in memory, you can uh, do some pretty interesting things. Th this is really representing some of the, the key use cases for, for larger memory products today, you know, starting on the left SAP HANA in memory database. Again, I'll come back to that. But essentially, SAP were one of the early movers in seeing that if they did move their database technology and not just transactions, but analytics as well to in memory in one system, you could be operating your business and also seeing how your business is operating today instead of looking at analytics that was you know yesterday, last week, last month. And so you can have much more real-time uh, decision-making. And similarly, Oracle and SQL Server have uh, you know, advanced their in-memory capabilities. The other areas I'll highlight a little more is actually on the high-performance computing and AI side, where, again, there's a number of areas. And, and typically, where you've got very much new data sources, you know, genomic data, um, and, and new algorithms that are being used to explore that data. Um, this is where getting your, your information in memory, acts, you know, basically computing at the sp speed of memory can, can really speed up uh, you know, understanding and uh, innovation. So you know, I'm not going to dig too much into this one. I, I, I've got a lot of material in this deck that will be available. Some of the slides I'm just going to jump over pretty quickly, but 
you know, they're in there just for the broader context. So today we're, you know, we're able to get tens of terabytes of database into a single operating system, which makes it really easy to access data, you know, at the speed of the processor load store instructions, you know, in, in a few hundred nanoseconds anywhere in the system to really give you that ability to do analytics at speed. So um, if we move on to the HPC world, um, one of the research institutes we've been working with in, in Germany, actually DZ&E, they work on Alzheimer's research. We work with them on their scientific pipeline, you know, a number of <clears throat> elements of their application and essentially by getting there, you know, making a few adjustments, things like expanding hash tables. So to take advantage of large memory, so um, you're, you're not uh, getting lots of clashes. Um, some other sort of, you know, fairly minor restructuring of, of the application, let them speed up that analytics pipeline, you know, by over a hundred fold. And so that literally means you can, the scientists can now ask questions, get answers back, and iterate much more quickly um, on, on uh, the, the workflow. And sometimes people think, well, 100x, what does that mean to me? Well, in, if it's in you know, life science, you know, it, it's literally, would you, if you uh, have a condition, would you rather see your analysis done today or you know, in three months' time, I think, to understand what treatment to go on? I think uh, we all would appreciate getting the answer today. Then um, another area we're working with by getting, uh, in this case, network traffic data into in memory, what we're able to do is um, find connections, unexpected patterns in data that could represent cyber security threats. And again, it's the fact that getting that whole data set into a single address space means I can rapidly access data without having to go through networking stacks or storage stacks. I just do direct load store to data. And with the, the capacities we're able to get to today, you know, there, there's uh, some really interesting cases that can be found. And especially not just searching traditionally with graph analytics, but doing things like unsupervised machine learning to, to raise up interesting um, areas of the graph for unexpected activity. Um, another classic case in, in HPC is just iterating on um, process development. So by having the ability to use pro simple and programming models, you know, running in a single system versus having to decompose and run them on a large cluster, you can get, uh, you can speed up your, your workflows. And then I think I've just got one more after this. In this case, we were doing work with the University of Cambridge on, you know, the uh, analysis of the early universe, um, where they had a 10 terabyte data set. And by getting that data into memory, what you could do is actually do a CPU driven visualization, uh, instead of having to filter down the data to fit on a GPU with, well, this was a, while, a few years ago, which could only at that point have a few gigabytes of memory. It's getting a little better now, but it's certainly not 10 terabytes. And you could do interactively visualize the data, spin things around, zoom in and out. And again, it lets the scientists, um, you know, through visualization, you know, the human eye is great at picking up discontinuity. So, you know, just, just like in the previous case, we need things like unsupervised machine learning to find needle in a haystack in a cyber security case, but in a, a, a sort of a understanding a scientific phenomenon, you know, the human visualization capability is really, really phenomenal at looking at, at and finding not only seeing things that they were expected to see with certain phenomena, but also potentially finding areas of unknown um, process going on. And then finally, Again, um, the US Postal Service in a way is similar to, to the network uh, analysis. In this case, looking at, at fraud detection, people duplicating e-stamps or other, other techniques. But in, because of the rate of 
um, processing uh, the items, you know, over over a hundred billion pieces a year. I mean, it's it's incredible the the rate of of data here that needs to be processed, and it's no good finding that you should have thrown out a duplicate e stamp once the post has been delivered. You got to do it in real time. So, getting the ability to look up key information in real time is is uh, very key. And you know, again, any real time, any online uh, shopping experience. You know, people are doing real time graph analytics, but when you press buy to that confirmation coming through and, and the real enabler for all of those techniques is having the ability to create systems with large memory footprints that you can have a, a single operating system running on. And, you know, today you can have Linux running up to 64 terabytes, you know, many thousands of CPU cores operating on, on a single data set. So um, you can rapidly uh, explore options of, of how to uh, find insights from data in memory. So moving on, um, I wanted to just sort of go back in time a little bit and talk about how uh, memory and systems has, has changed over, over the years. And I'm uh, just going back over my career early early days in my career at a company called Inmos in the UK, working on transputer microprocessors in the late eighties. In this time frame, um, we had, you know, a, a, a micro coded CPU um, with, with floating point capability on a piece of silicon, but actually four kilobytes of on chip uh, memory in this case, you know, SRAM and uh, and then communication links to connect these devices together. So, but what's interesting back in these days, there was no, um, uh, we didn't have any uh, virtual memory. It was the, the programming models were, were just making use of physical memory. There were no caches. The memory was explicitly allocated for application. So again, great for real time use cases because you're not missing in caches, but a, sort of a, an interesting um, look back to having memory closely coupled with CPUs, and you know, if you if you fast forward to what you we look at today, we've got obviously uh, you know many orders of magnitude higher CPU performance, but architecturally, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, you know interesting things here, in particular on the communication side, because with these direct channels that you can connect between these chips, you can build up arrays of processing and very simple, you know, instruction level support for moving data between the, the processors. Um, you know, it was a pretty interesting uh, chip for its day. And you could literally just connect these together, build up arrays, or you could build up modular designs with external DRAM connected to, to um, give you larger memory capacities in systems. And then moving sort of forward, the next um, sort of step from those sort of dedicated microprocessor based more in, in a way more embedded type deployment of CPU and memory technology, uh, moving into the you know, workstation space and desk side workstations back in the late eighties, early nineties. You know, at SGI, we had the uh, challenge, you know, shared memory systems and to scale memory capacity, you know, we were basically building a shared memory bus, adding memory on, onto that bus. But the challenge was how, how do you scale this? You, you end up with, you know, just that shared bus being a critical resource and contended access. So the next step we, we took on building larger scale memory systems was actually came out of uh, the DASH project of research at Stanford University. And the two lead authors of this paper, Dan Lenowski and Jim Loudon, um, were actually at, uh, came and joined SGI. And we worked on the, what became the, uh, did that skip, no. Um, 
worked on what we called our cache coherent NUMA architecture, scalable cache coherent NUMA architecture, where instead of just having CPUs on a bus to memory, we, we then had a memory fabric and a proprietary memory fabric to let us connect these chips together. And, you know, this architecture, uh, you know, let, we went through multiple generations and actually the, the foundational architecture of having what we called our Numalink technology um, has lasted through more than 20 years now. Our, our Superdome Flex I referred to earlier, you know, we're on our ninth generation of our Numalink interconnect that's managing cache coherence, you know, within this distributed shared memory system. So um, the key uh, thing you need to do when scaling coherence is to filter out messages so you don't have to go to every single CPU in the system to check if someone's got a copy of a line to invalidate it when someone's modifying data you, you use various filtering techniques and directory based shared memory to to only send coherence traffic to the interested CPUs in a system and so we, and we went through various packaging schemes blade based chassis based um, over the years um, the origin 2000 was that the first commercial distributed shared memory system we we shipped back in the, the mid 90s that was basically leveraging that dash research from Stanford. And what's interesting, uh, back in these, these days, um, not only were we, the, the, the MIPS microprocessor that we were using was designed at SGI in, for the system, the, um, the interconnect, in, in this case, we had two, two ASICs, a hub ASIC that was doing the coherence and a router ASIC to build the, the uh, memory fabric. These were designed in-house. We designed our own memory dims back in those days. We um, designed our own IO channels. We didn't have PCI Express back then. Actually, XIO that's in this system was actually pretty similar to, to PCI Express, as you know it today, a, a channel-based uh, you know, high-speed uh, serial link connection so and then we had our own operating systems and compilers so so literally the whole system you know was was built from the ground up uh, internally and and this was at sgi other companies were doing similar things when you know hewlett packard or sun microsystems you know various other system vendors so it's quite interesting to to reflect now how far we've come and again i'll touch on that as we move forward we we did also move to the, the initial Origin 2000 with this blade-based architecture. We then moved to what we call bricks or this chassis-based architecture with cables to connect them together to form the larger um, systems. But in, back here, we still we had things like memory bricks, so you could scale memory independently of CPUs. And, and back then, one of the key use cases was still what people want to do today with Oracle is reduce licensing costs. So have one chassis with, a, in this case, it was Itanium CPUs back in the early 2000s. The rest of the chassis were memory. So you could have just a couple of cores because back then we were single core CPUs and, you know, 16 terabytes was a big memory footprint back then. But you could independently scale the resources you needed on the fabric. And this logically, this is the picture. So we could have CPU-based um, nodes with some local memory, but you could still access all the other physical memory over the memory fabric in the system. We could actually have FPGAs talking um, onto our memory fabric. This this was probably way ahead of the curve. We you know must admit back then we struggled um, to get a lot of traction because you really needed back then to do your F FPGA design in a hardware design language. There wasn't uh, support like there is today for things like OpenCL, making it a little easier. We also, being SGI Silicon Graphics, we also had our connections to GPUs hanging off the fabric and, and general purpose IO interfaces to, to networking and storage. Um, we, we then, the next generation, 
one of the things we wanted to do was we would start seeing as we built and literally with with this um, previous system the, the Altix we built large supercomputers out of these one uh, you know at NASA we built what became the number two system on the top 500 and it was essentially um, th these uh, Altix systems we could build up to 512 CPUs which was 512 cores back in those days as one operating system and then we use early InfiniBand networks to basically have a fat node cluster of 20 of those uh, 512 processor systems. That was the number two on the top 500. But we started to see challenges in the communication network, um, especially for scientific applications that had, you know, interesting data patterns with, uh, and, and so we added in an in what we call the UV generation. This is when we move away from the Atanium processor onto, you know, Xeon and x86 instruction set architecture. We added a, uh, what we call the global reference unit, which was really more of a vector read, um, scatter gather engine, as well as atomic memory operation. So we could do fast synchronization across very large uh, fabrics. And we did have a, a, actually a 53-bit address space, so petascale capability. We never, back then we, I think the biggest systems were still in the order of, uh, you know, tens of terabytes. But um, this this architecture was at the same time when the industry was in, and SGI as well, were build, starting to build clusters around uh, two socket nodes, standard two socket nodes with InfiniBand. And so we were kind of, debating which is the right way to go. Should we go with an open standard network or should we effectively build a, a memory fabric and have clusters of our um, large fat nodes running on a, on a memory fabric? We ultimately, we scaled more in the cluster space, um, but some of the capabilities are there. The, the, um, the largest UV systems we ship were actually 256 Xeon, uh, Sky, uh, sorry, not Sky, Sandy Bridge processor systems with 64 terabytes of, of memory. And this is um, the Institute of St Statistical M Mathematics in Japan. Actually, these ship systems were shipped um, nine years ago now. I think at least one of them is still running. One of the things to remember in large memory systems is a lot of the benefit is around the speed of memory access, not so much the core processor speed. So you, you find the uh, useful lifetime of, of shared memory systems is, is much longer than, than uh, typical cluster systems. You know, because of this, you make a big investment in the memory and then take advantage of it for a long time. And then coming right up to date with the Superdome Flex, the current system we're shipping today, um, there's a motherboard picture here using Cascade Lake Xeons in the, the generation we're shipping. We're working on the, the version with our next generation memory fabric for Sapphire Rapids. So we'll come out hopefully uh, not too uh, much further into the future. Um, but with this picture, what you can see is we've now got standard Xeons that we're using. Those have standard PCIe um, IO channels coming off them. They also have industry standard DDR4 DIMM support. And what we're, the, the unique um, value we're bringing is the there's two ASICs, the Superdome Flex ASICs here, which basically connect direct to Intel's memory channel, the, the, the UPI fabric. And we scale that Intel's UPI you know, it's really targeted at two, four, maximum eight CPU designs. We, as you'll see, we go bigger than that. So we're expanding the capability of that protocol over a memory fabric. But yeah, unlike when you think back to when I mentioned the Origin 2000, designing pretty much every component in the system. Here, we're now, we just have this one secret source on the memory fabric and, and we, we leverage industry open Linux running on top, we've open sourced the scaling changes. So big difference in what you can 
in, in how you think about adding value today. Uh, the, this picture showing how we bring out that memory fabric using standard QSFP connectors with our memory fabric ASICs sitting underneath the motherboard of the, the main four socket uh, Xeon based system. And we can cable two of these together to form an eight socket, four chassis to form a 16. And then we've got enough links to directly connect together up to 32 Xeons, which today is, you know, 1700 or so, you know, threads of CPU execution. Um, to, and the maximum footprint is 48 terabytes in, in a si single rack configuration. The key thing is we've got direct fabric connections to go anywhere within that 48 terabytes. So from any processor to memory that's attached to any other processor that you've got direct load store access to, we have one fabric hop to get to it. And this is great for people like um, the developers of SAP HANA, who are when they're, they're tuning their code, they know as they go from a single chassis to the next chassis or all the way up to eight chassis, the, the latency profile that they're tuning for remains uh, the same. They're just getting more capacity and they're getting more cores to do other you know, throughput work. And just to sort of look at the latencies here, you know, when you've got memory directly attached to your socket on a Xeon today, you, you're, you're under 100 nanoseconds to get access. Going between two CPUs connected directly on UPI, roughly 150 nanoseconds. And then you can see I've highlighted in, in the, uh, the, the, when you go outside the four socket block to another, in this case, these are just for an eight socket system. You know, we're up into the, you know, sub 400 nanosecond region. So, so about 4X kind of um, NUMA, non-uniform latency impact. Um, but one of the key things, and again, working with people at SAP, they felt keeping the late memory latency on the memory fabric sub half a microsecond is really key to maintaining programming the system as a single system versus moving to, you know, when you get up to the microsecond latencies and beyond, you, you then start to, to think, well, maybe I should use message passing paradigms to um, move data around. So it's key for that agility of cache line transport, we keep the latencies down. Okay, so jumping into some memory storage uh, technology issues here. Um, you know, again, you're very familiar with this uh, sort of chart. Uh, apologizes from <laughs> micro, but it, it, it was the easy one I found to uh, demonstrate the, the, the latencies here. But I think what, what's, I always like to think of this more on the human scale. So if, if, I, if you think of a register access as one, you know, a cycle on a gigahertz processor, one nanosecond, think of that as a meter. So just a single pace of a human. Whereas if you go into cache on the chip, you're talking 10 nanoseconds order, you know, it's like walking across a room. If you're going to access DRAM, it's more like a hundred nanoseconds. So it's, you know, like a hundred meter, sprint to track length to go get your your data and and i mentioned on the superdome that fabric we you know we can go within 48 terabytes and under 400 uh nanoseconds that's like one lap of a of a track but if you think about one pace versus one lap of a track that's you know managing where data is is really important but then when you you think of um next layer up in, in technology shipping today will be something like uh you know 3d cross point technology you know order of 10 microseconds and then uh yeah 10 kilometer equivalent flash you know 100 microsecond we can argue about that. these are just ballpark numbers you know 100 kilometers and hard drive is like going across the continent so um I think at times we we kind of lose a bit of track of you know the distances here and and that's why I say when you you stick within that fabric based DRAM sub half a microsecond 
you can stay with the simple programming models, fast evolution of, of experiment type use cases. But obviously, again, you're very aware of how do we how do we blend some of these technologies to high um, latency? And I'll I'll come back to that. Um, 3D crosspoint again, you're very familiar, but it is kind of back to the future in sense of memory used to be um, persistent back in the day with magnetic core memory. Um, uh, I'm going to skip through this a bit. One of the interesting things though is the difference in in um, characteristics when you start looking at things like Optane, you know, 3D crosspoint DIMMs, you've got very different latency characteristics um, to get access to that technology. And, and especially on the bandwidth side compared to DRAM. So there's a lot of trade-offs and, and then a lot of work going into research and software about how to deal with, with this more complex memory hierarchy and again, Intel provides different ways of using this technology in the memory mode. It's actually not even using the persistence capability. It's really just trying to make use of the capacity and use DRAM as a cache in front versus app direct mode, which is kind of the way a number of applications like SAP HANA like to use it, where effectively you're, you're putting your storage within the you know direct connection to the processor you can do direct load stores by using you know pmem uh, uh, techniques to bypass file systems and enable applications to to get that effectively direct access you know through processor load store instructions to the media and but what's yeah, uh, I obviously uh, wanted to put the a pretty um, bit of breaking news, which again, I'm sure you, you a number of you immediately picked up on. You know, it's really interesting to see the announcement by Micron and how they're they're viewing the changing landscape in how you know kind of backing away from 3D crosspoint and emphasizing their um, interest in leveraging Compute Express Link, which I'll come back to in a minute, as, as a way to um, enable users to, to help deal with the, the complexity of data and, and the memory hierarchy. Um, I did, you know, again, com coming from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I couldn't not say something about, you know, a while ago, HP announced research into something called the machine and memristors as a, a way of having a large persistent memory pool, leverage optical interconnects to have uh, special purpose cores access that data. I think this vision is still actually pretty relevant. Just memristors haven't come to fruition in, as, as a bulk um, memory uh, technology, but they, they still have interesting use cases. And so the, the whole work of the machine project was about rethinking uh, computing and, and turning things somewhat inside out. This picture showing on the left-hand side, traditional cluster approach, network connecting nodes together. Everyone's got private um, data, whether it's DRAM or non-volatile memory. And then on the right, the traditional shared memory approach where you've got that you know, an Intel UPI or a Superdome Flex Numalink connection providing coherence between memories that are attached to processors. And the thought was, is there a middle way? Can we have a memory semantic fabric to um, sort of bridge the, the uh, paradigms here, have fabric attached memory, could be non-volatile, could be volatile, uh, you probably always want some local memory for performance reasons, but is this a better way to think about architecting systems going forward? And, and is this a faster way to unlock innovation cycles instead of having the CPU basically dictating the pace of innovation? Could we move to a memory fabric where that basically enables different people working on different technologies to innovate more at the natural rate of those individual technologies and um, take a, a quick sidestep here and because of time I'm going to go really quickly on these but again they're, 
in the deck for you to look at references. But Memrist as well, I, I said the vision of having them as a low cost mass memory device hasn't come to fruition. What has come to the fore is, again, as we move beyond where traditional CPUs are speeding up, the interest in using them as computing devices is, has, has come to the fore. And effectively, you can do Ohm's law computing. You can set um, uh, weights in as, as, as the resistance in, in the memristor, apply a vector of voltages, sum the currents, and you've done a, a multiply, you know, accumulate in the analog domain at low energy um, and, you know, very fast. So, so I think there's interest, you know, there's a lot of people talking about quantum computing, but I think more broadly, there's a lot of innovation to be done in non-traditional computing techniques, analog computing, neuromorphic computing, whatever, however you want to think of it. And there's a few more examples here using Hopfield networks with memristors to look for, you know, local minima in energy. Um, also using uh, memristors for um, content addressable memory innovation. And I won't, I, I'm going to skip the finite automata, but yeah, we're seeing some really interesting results in terms of energy efficiency. And this is where especially for, for devices at the edge, which are power sensitive. This, this can be really interesting technology. Leveraging um, uh, the, this capability for analog content addressable memories as well. So um, I think resistive RAM has a, a pretty interesting future in, in not only for, for sort of memory, but also computational techniques. So now, just a, going to be a really quick, uh, um, you yeah, know, update on the industry. And again, this it was. Um, I'm trying to think now. This would have been five years ago. Now, CCIX came to market as a way, way to how do we have more effective ways of connecting processes and accelerators and technologies together? How do we get memory semantics outside of the processor? And this was, and literally within months, you had CCIX. I'm going to talk about Open Cafe and I'll talk about Gen Z announce. And I think this was partly a combination of the PCIe ecosystem kind of getting stalled out for various reasons. And so people decided, no, we need to innovate more quickly. And so came up with creative ways of thinking about how do I get memory semantics outside of the processor? And and talk more directly, more intelligently with other processing capabilities. I'm going to skip through the open cappy. Um, you know, the Gen Z consortium started up, and its vision was let's instead of let's unlock the power of the CPU instead of having today huge numbers of pins dedicated to relatively low speed, wide DIM interfaces. Let's push to high speed serial links. You know, just like we do. You know. Um, when you look at networking technologies, they're running an order of magnitude faster bit rates than, than, than things like uh, memory technologies. And so there's that, that capability there, but how can we generalize it and, and effectively unlock the media specific capabilities from the processor to you know, drive faster innovation cycles? So the Gen Z consortium you know, was um, driven with IP that came out of the machine research project and, and continues to this day. And actually we will in a future Superdome will leverage that capability. And there have been demonstrations. This was from supercomputing uh, last time that happened in, in, in the physical world in 2019. So this was, there's a couple of demos with, you know, cross industry demos here between Hewlett Packard and Dell and um, some memory vendors. And uh, you know, glad, glad I did finally get to a Samsung uh, DRAM example here. Um, and then in another case, we were connecting using an FPGA to Gen Z. So you know, some real demonstrations of the benefits and there's work going on in Linux to 
drive up that capability. So lots of interesting things going on um, in the Gen Z world. Um, within the Superdome world, we also wanted to use our technology with some of the work going on from the machine project and push the limits on how we were building systems. So we did actually build a you know, multiple rack system. Our memory fabric scales beyond the single rack that we deploy as a standard product. And so this is a picture of the system, you know, 64 Xeon processors, in this case, 48 terabytes using 64 gig DIMMs, not 128s. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, we've, we've had a number of customers working with us with the software stack we ported over from the machine, looking at how we build towards future applications using larger scale memory fabrics. And the, the, the um, Linux for the machine and the librarian file system um, are open source codes. And, and we could basically use Superdome chassis to mimic uh, individual devices. So you could think of a chassis, even we could hide the processors. You've got persistent memory on your fabric using Intel Optane DIMMs. And so we did a number of proofs of concepts, you know, having this librarian file system to manage uh, fabric attached memory. And I don't really have time to go into the details of this, but we're effectively having, you know, three um, partitions access a memory off a fourth partition that's, that's accessible over the fabric. And this is really sort of technology that we, we see, you know, is, is going to be leveraged in the future now with the, um, the latest Compute Express Link consortium uh, coming to, um, so, sorry, um, with Compute Express Link coming to the market. Um, and one of the key things, unlike Gen Z and number of vendors, you see Intel on this list, you see AMD. So, you know, it's, it's immediately picking up traction. Um, there's there's going to be high volume opportunities for CXL attach points, but, you know, we think this is pretty exciting. And, and again, you, I, I know a lot of you are familiar with CXL. I'll skip through these, but how, again, basically CXL is, um, with Gen Z, it was more ground up, clean sheet approach to how do I get memory semantics out of the processor. CXL is leveraging, is building on top of PCI Express pins, you know, which is a much more evolutionary way to, to achieve, you know, similar ends. And, you know, what, what's interesting um, in the community is the fact that, you know, the CXL and Gen Z uh, consortiums um, signed an agreement to work together how uh, as an industry, do we uh, bring these together? Really, we, we uh, um, you know, for, for the, the best innovation, having a common standard is going to be the best way forward. So, you know, um, a lot of companies are working to look at future revisions of CXL and, and, and how do we expand the capabilities and you know potentially leverage Gen Z directly or, or or Gen Z learnings to well either bring them together or provide low overhead bridging from one to the other so that we can um, you know really have this open ecosystem of of uh, technology for for um, for systems as they evolve and as persistent memory or hybrid persistent memories built out of DRAMs and other um, uh, slower technologies come, how, how can we really keep driving up the innovation in, in the compute memory hierarchy to, you know, going back to that first slide, close that gap between the exponential growth of, of data with, you know, the, the uh, traditional computing techniques slowing down or, or be, um, becoming specialized and being need to be deployed at scale though, um, not just with the amount of memory that you can connect to a single device. So, so I think it's a, a pretty interesting um, future that we, we have in this space. And, you know, I know 
Samsung is working on some uh, great innovations. In, uh, and uh, I had the, the the pleasure of visiting Samsung headquarters in, in Seoul, you know, prior to COVID. So that, that was, uh, you know, a memorable trip and look forward to uh, working with, with uh, Samsung into the future.